Hi. Hope you are all doing well today. So this is the last um, chapter that we'll be doing, and it's chapter eight. So we're going backwards. Little explanation here. I was so excited about the chapter on musicals that I accidentally did it first. So, um, so we're going backwards a chapter and doing all the modernism. I call this the isms section because we talk about realism and absurdism and symbolism and all the, all the modernisms. So it's chapter eight. Um, chapter eight, the modern theater. So the modern theater beginnings. So the beginnings, it dates back to about 1875. We're looking, um, you know, right after the romanticism, we had talked about the, the, the comedies that were going, the comedies of manners and all that during the restoration. And then we had the melodrama and romanticisms and everything was romantic and there were heroes and heroines and um, life was all beautiful and it always ended up either very, very tragic or very, very happy, but they, you know there was a tragic hero and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then there, there were a lot of revolutions that were going on around the world. Uh, 1776 in America and then 1789 in France and all those things changed the world politically. But the industrial revolution also came in around this time and it kind of overhauled the social and economic systems. So suddenly, instead of needing a whole bunch of people to, you know, um, harvest the peas in the field or whatever, they had machines that would go out there and harvest them. And then it left people out of work, but then they needed factory workers to work in the factory and run the machines. So it shifted things and it shifted the way people looked at things. And sometimes people didn't like that. Um, the result was that we now had public communication and transportation. We had railroads. We had the, the birth of the car happened in the early 1900s. Um, we had expanded literacy. It used to be that not everybody knew how to read, but now people did. Um, it wasn't just the people who went to college or could afford to. Now we had um, schools where everybody was learning to read and we had more democracy there was a little more wealth to go around. And the, the demographic shift, it wasn't so, so many people didn't live in uh, rural areas anymore. More people lived in cities and towns and towns grew in different places to encompass where other people were, especially because we had the factories now. So that's where the work was. So that's where the people went. Okay, so Copernicus said uh, that humans are not at the center of the universe. Okay, and um, yeah, no, he wasn't, he wasn't very uh, popular for that kind of belief. Then we have Charles Darwin, who says even further, humans are directly linked to other mammals. And this was a really foreign idea, because remember, not only was the Western, um, Western world, at first it was all you know, once we became Christian, Christian evolved into Catholicism. So everybody was Catholic, except for then, um, you know, Henry VIII protested against Catholicism because they wouldn't let him get divorced. He had to kill his wives and stuff like that to get another one. So then he decided he wanted divorce. So he protested again. So then we have the Protestants. And then we have people that even protested further. We have Martin Luther and a whole lot of other people like that. But still, all of it revolved and, or, and, and came about from Christianity and the stories, you know, Judeo-Christian beliefs of Adam and Eve. And then Charles Darwin comes and says, no, we didn't come from Adam and Eve. We are descendant from of monkeys, of other mammals. And that kind of rocked people's worlds. Then we have Ruth Benedict who came in and said, morals are handed down from a complex range laws, at, uh, from a complex range of laws and traditions relative to the climates and cultures we live in. Not one supreme source. In other words, God doesn't rule ev everything. Um, we are a product of how we were raised. We are a product, if you live in a different part of the world and they have different laws, um, you know, everybody doesn't fall under the Ten Commandments. And um, it's all very complex. And uh, your environment you know, um, determines how you are, not God. So these are all ideas that are coming around the same time that affect 
we know theater reflects life and what's going on. Art reflects life, what's happening around us. So all of these are kind of in response to what's going on in the world. And this is what's going on in the world. Um, by the turn of the 20th century, scientific questioning replaced intuition and dogma as accepted avenues to truth. So we were going to look at things scientifically. We're not going to look at things just as they have always been. And we're not certainly not going to look at religious dogma. We're certainly not going to look at, you know, whatever the Pope says as we're going to accept that because he says so. Um, and so now we're going to look at things scientifically. All right. And thus was born the modern theater. So modern theater, yeah, it's older than we are now. Modern theater isn't quite as modern. It's historical and modern at the same time. Uh, it's a theater of challenge. We're gonna challenge beliefs that we've always had. We're gonna challenge the way things have always been. Um, and it's a theater of experimentation, but it is not a theater of rules or of simple messages. There's not just a nice little moral to the end of the story as there was in melodrama or in romanticism or in any of the genres that we've had before. A modern theater is going to try to mix it all up and challenge everything we know. The first thing that happened was realism. Instead of having like big characters, we were gonna have realistic sets. Um, we wanted it to look like, um, it was called a box set. So if you imagine the back wall and the two side walls of a house and they just took away one of the walls, you're supposed to be looking in. So that's why they call this the fourth wall. The fourth wall is our window into what's going on. And so when an actor turns and faces the audience and talks to the audience, they call that breaking the fourth wall. So, but in realism, they're not looking at the audience. We're just peering in and basically eavesdropping on other people. So realism's goal was to create a likeness to life. And instead of having actors represent characters, we wanted the actors to be the characters. We wanted to see inside these people's lives and see inside their soul and see what it was that was going on. Instead of having a dialogue um, you know, stand for our conversation, we wanted to make the dialogue be the conversation. So instead of using big superfluous words and trying to give some morality or something, um, underneath my big pontification, they wanted to have people to speak as if they were really talking, to talk as people really talk. Um, they, want, they wanted to let the setting and the costumes be real places and real clothes. We didn't have, <laughs> it's funny because when you do a realistic play and you go on and there's still a costumer that says, okay, we're going to put this red shirt and these jeans on, you know, what size do you wear? And you're like, well, can't I just pull it from my closet? And it's really kind of like that. You can look at this set and think, oh, that could have been somebody's kitchen. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I could see that. Yes, this is like uh, somebody's kitchen around the 1950s, but still, you could see that. Okay, and in realism, the nature of human relationships are objectivity presented for the judgment of the audience, are objectively presented for the judgment of the audience. Let me try that one again. The nature of human relationships are objectively presented for the judgment of the audience. Basically, here is what's going on. You decide whether it's good or bad. Now, obviously, the playwright's going to influence you some, but, but they want to just show it to you as it really is. Box sets came into prominence. Um, well, like I was telling you about, that it's just the square so that we're looking in. And um, characters are well-defined by detail and not by symbol or abstraction. It's not like this person represents the good in the world and this person represents greed and this person represents, you know, avarice and, you know, all those things. They are people and people are all mixed up inside. People have good parts and bad parts. And in realism, we get to see that the audience gets a companion in the characters. So it's like we know them um, and the audience gains a better understanding of their own struggles. So we identify with people that we see in realistic 
scenes. I don't know how many of you, you know, watch television shows like um, Grey's Anatomy or um, Ozark or, you know, any of those cop dramas, CSI and Law and Order. Yes, they're elevated, but they're supposed to be situated in reality so that we're supposed to have some sort of a, um, a of a connection with those characters. So um, an idea of what kind of things go on in my house. My mother was very big into every crime drama ever from Perry Mason on, um, you know, so that was always on in my house. <laughs> okay, pioneers of realism. Henrik Ibsen, okay. He's got funny hair, but that's okay. Um, he was one of the pioneers of, he's actually called the father of dramatic realism, Henrik Ibsen. He wrote a play called A Doll's House. And one of my other theater appreciation courses, we actually read it. And um, it was very controversial when it first came out because he deals a lot with women's issues. And it was a woman who was basically treated like a little doll, like she didn't have uh, the ability to make decisions. And her husband got sick and she made a decision, a big decision, and kind of forged his signature. And after he got, it saved his life. But after he got well, he was angry with her and like uh, just furious that she did this. And he would have died otherwise. And she finally says, you know what? I've got enough of this and I'm leaving. Okay, back in this time, 1867, a woman didn't leave a man and she had children. So she left her children. She left everybody. And it was very, very controversial, but it was something that could really happen. And obviously it did happen in another one. A ghost is another one, 1881, and an enemy of the people in 1882. Um, and due to Ibsen, realistic, tech, or realistic theater spread throughout Europe. People saw this and went, wow, this is cool. This is talking about real people and real things. And then other people started doing realistic work also. Problem plays were popular where, where like in a doll's house, Nora is the, um, the um, protagonist of that play and she has a problem. Okay, so problem plays. George Bernard Shaw, you may have heard this name also. He created comic realism. His plays are very funny. Um, he uh, wrote a play called Mrs. Warren's Profession, and you can guess what Mrs. Warren's Profession was. And that was something that was not talked about at the time, 1892. You did not talk about prostitutes. Um, so, but um, he did, and, and it was banned. It was like people wouldn't, wouldn't go see it or people wouldn't produce it for a long time. A major Barbara, the daughter Barbara, uh, ends up being a very strong figure. And Pygmalion, if you've ever seen or heard of the um, musical My Fair Lady with Audrey Hepburn and Rex Harrison, it is based on Pygmalion. So strong female characters. And then there's Anton Chekhov. And you may have heard this name before because um, his plays were the ones that Stanislavski did. And Stanislavski, you'll remember we talked about in our acting class, or acting class, acting um, chapter. So he worked with Stanislavski at the Mas Moscow Art Theater. Um, he wrote a lot of the plays that Stanislavski directed. And his technique, was to create complex relationships that happen between the lines. If you read his plays, they kind of look boring, but it's the subtext. It's what they're saying underneath the lines that brings the tension in the drama. They could just be talking about, you know, two men are sitting there talking about um, places that they had been, you know, where they had gone in the world. And if you read about it, it's really like two guys kind of bragging a little bit about where they went but if you understand the subtext there are two other women in the room that they are each trying to impress when they're saying this so you're going to say differently well i went to such and such oh that's very nice oh it's wonderful but oh well you know while i was there once too and while i was there i did this and this and this and and so again you can't read that in the lines 
but when you know what's going on, it makes it more complex. So it happened between the lines or under the lines. The Seagull is one of the plays that he wrote, and I was actually in this play. Um, one of the, the lead characters' name is Arkadna, and she is a big personality. And when she walks into the room, everyone must notice and everything is very dramatic, but she feels it to her soul. So um, it was a very fun role to play. Um, and then there's Uncle Vanya and the three sisters. But Chekhov, he tries to deal with how people really talk and how they really feel. And so it, it worked really well with Stanislavski because he was trying to get people to be the, the, uh, the character. And so um, working with Chekhov's plays it worked really well. Oh, and the Cherry Orchard. It's one of his most famous ones, actually. Naturalism. So naturalism came about kind of, um, it took realism and it pushed it further. So they thought realism wasn't real enough. And it was an attempt to dramatize human reality without the appearance of dramaturgical shaping. So we didn't want anything to symbolize anything. We wanted to take, um, they call it verisimilitude, a slice of life. We are going to go, it, it normally had to do with very, um, very poor people or very bad situations. We're gonna to go to the back alley. We're going to cut a slice of that and we're just gonna put it on stage. And their dialogue may not move the plot along. It's just gonna be like, we're looking at somebody for a couple of hours and see what they do. So it was a slice of life. And there were no dramatic conventions. There was no intermission, okay? You were just basically looking into whatever somebody else did, because life doesn't have intermissions. You know, yeah, we all do stop to go to the bathroom, but if you're in the middle of an argument, you don't. You... Um, Emilio, Emil Zola, okay? Emil Zola. He was naturalism's chief theorician. And it, he said it was not just a style, but it was a philosophy concerning human nature that humanity doesn't just, um, we're not just for show. We want to see people. We want to see the dirt underneath their fingernails. Um, you know, we want to see the sweat on their forehead. We want to see what really, really happens in life. And so naturalism, it didn't last very long, but it, it took things to quite an extreme sometimes. Some naturalistic playwrights, August Strindberg, okay, he exemplified the tenets of naturalism in the play Miss Julie. And Miss Julie, um, so Miss lives in the household and um, her servant, she ends up having an affair with her servant. And when she goes into... <clears throat> with him into the back bedroom that we don't see a bunch of peasants enter the kitchen and kind of do things to cover the time during intermission so it doesn't really have an intermission although while the peasants are there if you wanted to go to the restroom or go get a drink I guess you could uh, but then the play just continues on so he, he tried to make it naturalistic and um, make something happen while there was no one on stage. Because at the time you wouldn't have written the sex scene to be done on stage. Okay, another naturalistic playwright, Arthur Schnitzler. Okay, so he eliminated conventional scenes beginning and ending in La Ronde. So the way a scene would normally end, like we would end a scene and the lights would fade out and then we'd come up on another scene. Well, he would have one actor, <coughs> excuse me, stand on the stage and transition from one scene into the other. He would not dim the lights. He would not end, a, he would end and begin scenes, but there would still be at least one actor on stage and people would leave and people would come back. Um, so a character from the last scene is present until the next scene, until we get right back to where the play started. Okay, another naturalistic playwright is Eugene O'Neill. 
and his early plays were very, very naturalistic. Um, but his masterpiece was called Long Day's Journey into Night. And you might recognize O'Neill. His father was Edmund O'Neill. And um, the story, Long Day's Journey into Night, is autobiographical. It was about him and his father. As a matter of fact, it was so autobiographical that he did not allow it to be produced until several years after his death because he didn't want people he figured after he died I, who cares <laughs> but he didn't want people to know what actually went on in his life until after that so production or publication was forbidden by him until several years after his death in 1953 but it's considered his masterpiece so in his lifetime no one even knew he wrote it Okay, so contemporary 20th century playwrights um, that are influenced by realism and naturalism, there are a lot of them. So Arthur Miller, we've actually talked about him. Um, he wrote also uh, Willie Loman, Death of a Salesman, okay? But he also wrote The Crucible, A View from the Bridge, All My Sons, and all these, um, they are kind of, realism and naturalism kind of smushed together. Uh, Tennessee Williams. So he wrote The Glass Menagerie and A Streetcar Named Desire. And um, he was from the South. I believe he was from New Orleans because most of his characters are from there. Uh, and he also blended the two. And then August Wilson. And August Wilson is the playwright that you're going to be reading for this section. Um, he wrote the play Fences. He also wrote The Piano Lesson and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. August Wilson decided to write a play for each decade of the 1900s. So he wrote, I believe, a play that takes place in 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970, and I think 1980. I don't know if he got to 1990. I'm not sure. sure. He might have. He lived till 2005. Um, but the one that we're reading takes place in 1950. So that would be Fences. And um, it's one of his best works. So, but he also, it's a realistic play. Realism, realism and naturalism. Okay, then, so those things were so real, real, real that, that, and it was kind of a rebellion on the melodramatic things that had gone on before. Well, now we have a rebellion against the rebellion. So now these are, plays are so real that we have to go anti-real, all right? We have to go something completely different. So that's when the symbolist came out. Symbolism it was the symbolist revolution. It began in Paris during the 1880s, but um, they sought to express the inner realities that cannot be directly perceived by the audience. And human beings are presented not as individuals, but as symbols of philosophical ideas. So now we're back to people being the symbol of greed, of hunger, of death, of, you know, whatever. Um, but they also had a second goal, and that was to reinforce traditional aesthetic values. They wanted to write in poetry and promote imagery and novelty and fantasy and profundity. Um, purity of vision was sought over the accuracy of observation. So we don't care how real it looks. We care that our characters and our set and our lighting all symbolizes what it is that we're trying to get across. So the realist versus the symbolist. This affected every aspect of the theater production, okay? It was an advent of stage lighting via electricity, expanded all the opportunities for stylized production. So remember when gas lighting came in, all of a sudden we were able to be indoors at night and have the lights go higher and lower. Well, now we had electricity, so we could do all sorts of things with, with lighting. And we could have several instruments and some on and some off. And, and they had a thing called gobos. And gobos is when you have a light shining and you have something that goes over that light that creates a pattern or shadows on whatever you're projecting it onto. 
Um, so this gave a whole lot of um, opportunities. They also, if you have a lighting instrument, they have a thing called a top hat that goes on it and it actually has little square size that you can open and close to make the light bigger and smaller. All sorts of wonderful things happen in the world of lighting. And modern art trends led to scenery and costume designs that departed from radically, departed radically from realism. Okay, so they were completely different than realism. The symbolist, you know, uh, you know, e if you have a, a woman, you know, they might walk in w wearing a, a big fig leaf, okay, and it was supposed to be, they were symbolizing Eve or something. So they weren't, they weren't realistic in any way. Okay, we are again in the era of isms. So the first third of the 20th century was the era of isms. Remember, 20th century is 1900s, okay? We are now in the 21st century, so we're in the 2000s. So we are living the 21st century. So 20th century was 1900s. Okay, the older forms, um, this is what happened first, futurism, Dadaism. Okay, futurism, everything was very futuristic, um, obviously, and, you know, otherworldly. Dadaism was an ism where, um, imagine taking, I, I love to do this in class, taking like a magazine or newspaper and just cutting up all the different words that they're, so that they're symbol words, drop them into a hat, mix them all up, and pull them out one at a time. So it says, you know, shoe, hair, and is the clown, whatever it is, that's Dadaism. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's words, and sometimes it's just sounds, da, 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 da. Okay, very strange ism. Idealism, okay, went for everything had to be the uh, most ideal it could possibly be. Impressionism. If you look at impressionistic art, it doesn't matter what uh, what it looks like. It's what is impressed into you. What's impressed in your soul? What do you feel when you see this? Same with theater. Um, expressionism. We're going to talk a little bit more with constructivism. Constructivism actually was very mechanical in nature, and you could see everything that was going on. And expressionism also. Um, it was that you wanted to um, see the the background of what what was going on. Surrealism. Think of um, uh, Salvador Dali with the melting uh, clocks, right? That's surrealism. The newer forms, the newer isms, are postmodernism. So we've had modernism. And then anything afterwards, which combines one or more. So we might take realism and mix it with surrealism and mix that with some expressionism and some symbolism and some Dadaism and some theater of the absurd or something like that. And that's postmodernism. It mixes all different things together. The theater of cruelty, um, which was our toe. And um, it, it, it wasn't cruel like um like he wasn't being mean about it so it it didn't mean it, it meant cruel like he wanted people to think okay he wanted people to uh, he didn't want them to go oh that was a nice night at the theater he wanted to like rip open the band-aid and expose everything um, existentialist so jean paul sartre and avant-garde yeah I'm a tree. Okay, we've seen things like that. Um, theater of the absurd, which is just nothing makes sense. It's absurd. And it's meant to be. And alienation means I'm trying to alienate the audience. I want you to hate me by the end of the play. So the entire spectrum of non-realistic modern theater can be referred to as stylized. Okay, if you see a place like that, you can say, yes, that, that was very stylized. Okay. Uh, theatric theatricalism. Okay, that was a theatricalism is one of the isms where we're going to show you um, not we're going to not just have the light shining down on them, but we're going to bring the lighting instrument down so you can see there's a lighting instrument shining on the stage. 
okay, so that we can turn the set around so you can see this is not really a wall, it's just a set piece. The, you know, these are um, not real, they're, they're props. See, this is a plastic gun or whatever. They want, they want to make sure that the audience knows that these things are not real. That's yeah, very strange because when we say something is theatrical, we usually think it's, oh, it's in the theater. But theatricalism wanted people to know they were in a theater. Okay, so expressionism, surrealism, classicism. I wanted to go back to the classics, um, the Greek classics, you know, we're doing things the same way that they would do. And then romanticism. It's all a style now you can say they're stylized and then avant-garde the word avant-garde actually comes from the military um it meant that they were the first troops to arrive to attack the enemy they were the shock troops the the enemy didn't know they were coming and the avant-garde was the one that was in the front okay and they were the ones that would just like attack so avant-garde literally means you know surprise you okay shock you and that it used to refer to experimental and non-traditional approaches to things. Okay, theatricalism, I was just talking about this. It shows us the truth of our world by imitating our objectives, imitations of it. And it shows us the truth of the self-conscious performance we call living. It's trying to show you that what you're seeing on stage isn't real. It's theatrical, it's just for show. And the elements of the performance are exposed. Like I said, the lighting is exposed. And, um, you know, you can see that these are costumes. It might be like halfway buttoned up in the back and you can see that they're wearing a t-shirt underneath. They want to show you that this is just for show. Um, this is a production of Our Town by Thornton Wilder done by Trinity University. And they kind of, they're in uh, their costumes but this is the set. Our town is kind of written so that um, when people die, when they're in a graveyard, they're actually just sitting in a chair on stage and that's the graveyard. So very different. Okay, The Lion King. With The Lion King, there's no um, attempt to cover up that these are people in these costumes, that these are costumes. We do not think when we go there, oh, that's a real antelope. Oh, that's a, a real cheetah. Oh, that's a real giraffe. We can see that there are people underneath. So, and we can see that Mufasa is a person with a headpiece on top, okay? There is no attempt to hide the fact that these are people. It's beautiful, it's poetic but it's also part of theatricalism. Okay, expression. Expressionism. This was developed in the early 20th century in Germany and doctors theorized that we can learn the truth about ourselves by analyzing our dreams. So these are expressionistic um, plays are usually very dreamlike. And you know in a dream things are not connected right? Um, they have that commercial. So in your dream, you're playing, you know, uh, cards with um, Abraham Lincoln and an otter, you know, <laughs> so that, that's the kind of things that we have, right? So it's a, based on the belief that dreams actually re reveal the truth that we hide from ourselves when we're awake. We wake up and you think, what was that? Okay, that was weird. And unless you are one of those people that keeps a dream journal and tries to analyze your dreams, we just suppress those things. Um, I always try to remember my dreams and write them down uh, so I can look it up and think, ah, I don't, I don't know. That's not, that's not good. Uh. Um, sometimes the expressionism depicts violent and extreme emotions. And um, the average human being is turned into a cog in the machine. There's no superstars in the plays. Um, expressionistic theater has an angry tone and it's a, a shocking, startling appearance. So it's not supposed to be a happy theater experience. Yeah, so this is a characteristics of expressionist theater. So the world is shown through the eyes of a central character. There's usually one character. 
Um, the visual designs use garish colors and sharp angles. So this is an example here. We've got these sharp angles and it looks like the arms are, you know, draped over the other arms and it's not, it's not pretty. Uh, the central character is complex, but supporting characters are just symbols. They are just show one symbolic trait and that's all. And they're short, choppy sequences. They kind of chop it all up. Surrealism. Okay, well, I was talking this. This is the Salvador Dali painting that is, um, you know, we've all seen before that it symbolizes surrealism. Did that sound right? Anyhow, surrealism. Um, it was developed in France after World War I, and it was based on the belief that the images in our subconscious, so not quite our dreams, but in our subconscious, reveal the truth and can be beautiful, lyrical, and sometimes even funny. They believe that you can release the images that are in your subconscious, even when you're awake. Okay, five traits of surrealism. The images are uh, offered in curves and in pretty pastel colors. Um, the pressure of realistic time and space is relaxed. So things don't always have to take place in real time. Okay, you can, it might take a long time or a short time, could be many years happen in two minutes. the images change into other images in front of our eyes, Whoa, kind of morph into different things. Words transform into pictures in a whimsical way. And the associative logic prevails. So associative logic, um, if you think of those um, ink blot tests, tests, you know, what does this look like? Okay, oh, that, that looks like a butterfly. Oh, okay. That tells you what's in your subconscious that is trying to come out. Classicism, all right, back to the classics. So this is based on the belief that we can learn the truth if we use our powers of reason to create an ideal world, an ideal classical world, we can figure out what, you know, the mystery is of life. Um, it rejects excess. So um, the whole stoicism theory that there is moderation in all things. You can have a drink, but don't drink to excess. You can eat some ice cream, but don't eat the whole carton, you know, um, you can, you know, work, play, romance, um, entertainment, you can do everything, but nothing to excess, moderation in all things. It approves of balance and proportion in everything that we do. Okay, in design, classicism is very formal, austere, and it evokes the uh, essence of ancient Greece. If you say, oh, that's very classical, when you're looking at architecture, you're going to see Greek kinds of pillars and things like that. Okay, the language of classical drama is elevated in tone and in form. We are a little bit above whatever the normal person would speak. We might speak eloquently and in poetry. Okay, so places, classic, classicism has been prominent, uh, fifth century BC, Greece. Okay, 17th century France and 19th century America, especially in the architecture. So we're talking about the 1800s, so the 19th century, if you look at things that were built in America during the 1800s, they have that those kinds of pillars, that kind of architecture, that kind of um, clean classic look. All right, oops, I'm still screen sharing. Okay, good. Romanticism. 
So in romanticism, the truth can be found by celebrating the quest for perfection. We are looking for that romantic ideal, that hero who is striving to better themselves. Um, it's a very romantic notion. And the truth is discovered through feeling the emotions of our idealized image of perfection. So we, we are going to look at perfection and we are going to discover the truth because we want to strive to get there. An, an image of perfection is based on emotions, not reason. When you ask someone, you know, what's the perfect whatever in your life? It's an emotional response. It's not, well, an idealized would be this, 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 this. I apologize because I think my son is squeaking upstairs for some reason, but such happens when you are working from home. Okay, um, objective reality is disappointing. So we escape it for an idealized truth. So if we're looking, we, we don't like our life. You know, um, we were talking in the last section about that, uh, that video I had you watch, it sucks to be me. It sucks to be me, right? So that's disappointing. So we don't want to think about that. In romanticism, we escape to an idealized truth. Think those Hallmark shows. Okay, everybody ends up happy at the end. Okay, traits of romantic theater. This is Don Quixote, by the way, the man of La Mancha. Um, characters are exceptional. They are different from the norm. They are larger than life. Um, idealized characters, they speak in idealized dialogue. So they speak with a, um, in a more haughty uh, voice, not necessarily haughty, an elevated tone, poetic. Okay. Um, several locales in romantic theater and it flip-flops between happy and sad scenes. So you could be happy one minute and then we're looking at something sad and then we're going to go back to some comedy and then, you know, but then there's the reality of what's going on. Um, and that brings us to the end of the isms. So um, I really enjoyed having you guys in this class. Also, if you have a minute, go to ratemyteacher.com and find me. And uh, it should be under SAC and it should be under um, George and A. Hudmel. And so I'd really appreciate your feedback. This is one of the first all online classes that I've done. So I'd really like your feedback so that I can continue to grow as a teacher. And um, I hope that you have enjoyed this and I hope that you've enjoyed the videos and I hope that you've learned something and that you appreciate theater. And um, if you have any questions or need me for anything, please email me. I will, I will be around. <laughs>